India's air pollution hits its worst ever levels, leaving a country of one billion people struggling to breathe. The Supreme Court blames state governments. But is it really their fault, or is pollution being politicized? I'm Imran Garta, and today's newsmaker is India's air emergency. I don't smoke, but if I walked through the streets of New Delhi today, not only would it be hard to see through the smog, it would also be as if I've smoked 50 cigarettes. Pollution is at unbearable levels, and according to the capital's chief minister, being in Delhi is like living in a gas chamber. Schools have been shut down, cars taken off the road, and millions are being forced to wear protective masks. So who's responsible for India's toxic atmosphere? The Supreme Court says state governments are to blame. It accuses them of being more interested in gimmicks and winning elections than actually tackling the issue. And it seems many in the capital agree. Journalist Ishan Russell is in New Delhi where protesters have gathered to demand something be done about the pollution. We are here at India Gate where uh, citizens really have gathered to protest against uh, the pollution and what they allege is the lack of apathy from the government, uh, both the state government and the central government to take action on this particular issue. And uh, that is something that uh, is really bothering them because uh, the air was a lot clearer today than it has been over the past 48 to 72 hours. But uh, still, it's of a very unhealthy quality on the air quality index, it's uh, around 200, uh, where a normal should be between uh, 20 to 30. So that is uh, the extent of air pollution that uh, the residents of Delhi have been fighting with on a daily basis. And they're out here to protest right now to ask the government to take action, to take concerted action, because that is what it requires. This problem is spread over many states in North India, uh, Punjab, Haryana, and of course, the farm fires over there, uh, the smoke from there is is billowing into Delhi. So that is what is causing this pollution from an added perspective, other than the vehicular pollution and other factors. Well, as we just heard, India's problem of pollution isn't limited to New Delhi. Of the 30 worst polluted cities in the world, 22 are in India. Why and what's the solution? Well, to help answer that, I'm joined now from Sambalpur in India's state of Odisha by Ranjan Panda. He's a convener at the Combat Climate Change Network in India. And in New Delhi is Avikal Somvanshi. He's an urbanologist and a program manager for the Sustainable Cities Program at the Center for Science and Environment. Gentlemen, good to have you both on the program. Ranjan Panda, who's to blame? Is it simple enough to actually pin the blame on the government? Uh, I don't think, but then... Uh... But the governments are responsible for the policy making. So uh, they have had enough time to make policies. And uh, there is one thing that we need to understand now is India is a federal uh, structure government. And uh, uh, if, if, when, when you see conservation issues, uh, when you see this kind of pollution issues, when you see uh, river, river management issues, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, fed, the federal cooperation is virtually missing in India. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, this problem could have been tackled so far as the stubble burning is concerned. Right. Uh, I, I, think, I think for that, there's a huge political uh, will that is lacking. Uh, I, I think uh, politicians should now look more beyond the votes and winning elections than actually cooperating on conservation and air pollution, because that is going to kill... Uh, a lot of Indians is already reducing the productivity of the youth, and in fact, is uh, huge issues uh, considering the fact that you know India fastly moving into urban areas. So, uh, and and if if Delhi kind of cities face this kind of uh, you know problem, then we are actually in a problem. Uh, we are actually in a huge huge crisis. Uh, right. Not only today, but uh, but by 2030, when you see a lot of people will be in the cities. Uh, you know, trying for employment, mm -hmm. uh, as because the rural areas are already, uh, you know, sort of uh, already failing to provide employment to the people. So everybody is moving to cities. Right. 
and that's the yeah. pollution combined right. with this right this kind. right and that, that that's a big problem yeah. here right and and i'm interested in, in hearing what the urbanologist has to say about this because this is a natural trend right as the country develops more and more people move towards the cities have we had enough evidence now over the past few days that the leadership is taking this very seriously so we've had the supreme court say the government's to blame we have the chief minister using saying it's like a gas chamber i mean some people would find that really offensive but it definitely shows that they are freaking out to an extent so both for the present and the future have we had enough evidence that the government is finally taking this seriously so uh, let me add to it it's just not this year which this has happened and and it has been a, it's a regular phenomena delhi and ad, ad, adjoining regions have high pollution throughout the year and during this specific period when the temperatures fall and the wind speed is low it starts to get it, it becomes visible and it starts to become more concentrated and the forest fires in the and the fires in the paddy fields in northern india adds to this load so it has become a big problem now and it will continue to remain a problem as the temperature drops and the wind speed gets lower because of that the pollutants generated within the city and coming from outside the city linger on they don't dissipate and they move away so it becomes what the chief minister call it into a gas chamber during this period but problem is there throughout the year and it's a issue of how we are doing our development and urbanization mm. the way we are building our cities the way we are providing infrastructure and amenities which the modern india needs is problematic and that's one of the reasons of why we are in this situation we don't have enough public transport so people are dependent upon uh, private vehicles and to commute which lead which is one of the major local sources of pollution right then the technology we have and the quality of fuel we have in this country is also of a serious concern then we talk about other sources of pollution which is like burning of waste whether it's the agricultural waste in the field or the domestic waste and municipal waste within the city that adds to the thing so overall city governance and larger all waste management in this country has become a big issue then there is the issue of power generation so we are still relying on coal power based plants to supply electricity to the city and there are multiple power plants in this vicinity in this region and also a lot of the households and colonies and businesses depend upon uh, diesel generators to generate their own power because the state is not able to provide 24/7 electricity so and all this adds up to the pollution which is being generated and you take into account the adverse atmospheric conditions which developed during right. this period which results in a smog yes it's a failure on all the governments whether it's central government the state government or the city government because they are not able to provide the infrastructure but it's also the failure on side of people as well because they are not taking care of the of the things they do the, whether it is the waste generation at the home how they deal with it the mm -hmm. choice of commute they make and things like that okay. so it's a failure at all the levels and there needs to be check and balances and course correction from citizens to the governments yeah systemic to failure this certainly seems to be systemic failure so ranjan panda the the government can close schools it can hand out face masks it can restrict traffic on the roads it can do all of this but is the bitter reality that india needs to change its entire economy and the way it approaches it in order in order to tackle this properly yeah yeah i think i think today today only i blogged uh, you cannot you cannot buy you know uh, clear sky you cannot buy a blue sky you can have money you can have a gdp centric growth but buying uh, clear sky is absolutely not your forte so i think exactly that is the problem development the way we are developing and i think people definitely need to take a lot of choices but then the policy makers have to take the responsibility and they must uh, you know look into all the policy and all the kind of development priorities that they are making both in the cities and there is and uh, you know the north indian states that are being blamed mm -hmm. for example 
uh, you know, a, a policy or water policy in 2009 in Punjab changed the kind of the timing of the paddy, uh, the sowing of the paddy, the harvesting, you know, making this, uh, this problem in November much more uh, severe uh, than before. Uh, so kind of there is, that's why I said federalism in a way has failed in India when it comes to, you know, working together on these kind of issues. So that needs to be properly tackled now. Right. Of course, uh, you know, the, uh, looking into the history of uh, how we manage our garbage, like Supreme Court, uh, nobody listens to Supreme Court. You know, you see this, the problem with garbage management in Delhi only. Supreme Court has been uh, sort of wrapping the government time and again, but that remains as such. You, you see the knee-jerk, uh, you know, reactions in heat wave, for, for example. That's something that has been striking India and, and increasingly. The same is happening. Schools are closed in, in the heat wave-prone regions. But then nobody talks about climate change. Nobody talks about how urban forests can be conserved. I think mitigation measures are something that now needs to be looked into right. rather than knee-jerk you know, sort of responses to disasters. Okay. So I think the same needs to be looked into in this right. case as well. Okay, and as my final question to you, Avikal, and if you could keep your answer very brief, I would appreciate that. For those who say, well, look at China, look at Beijing and Shanghai, and look at the Europeans 100 years ago, Victor well, or, or more, Victorian Britain and so on, that was polluted. This is just the price you pay for development. How do you respond to them? You are correct. This uh, is a price we pay for development. But as you said earlier, European, European cities have done it 100 years ago. Chinese have done it recently. And we know what mistakes they made. And the question we need to ask, why are we repeating those mistakes? Why haven't we learned from them and take a different course of action so that we don't have to suffer the way we are suffering now? And we know how the remedies are. There have been examples from around the world. And we need to start reflecting on those and adopt them in the way we are doing development now and how we are framing the policies. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure talking to you here on the Newsmakers. I thank you so much for joining us. Now, this year, Indonesia gave Joko Widodo a second term as president, but it was an election mired in controversy. His rival, Prabowo Subianto, says the poll was rigged against him. But then, in a shock twist, he was appointed to Widodo's cabinet as defense minister. Well, I spoke with Prabowo's pick for vice president and the man who bankrolled his campaign, Sandiaga Uno. I began by asking him what he made of the president's surprising decision. They want to project the message, a very clear message of unity mm -hmm. um, since the elections of 17th of April. Uh, it's rather, uh, things have changed a lot. There are uh, more uh, issues coming up, like the Papua issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is very important in these economic conditions where slowdown is uh, projected to, to have on few of the um, uh, economic fronts. Uh, it's the, um, the two sides felt that um, it is rather very crucial to be uh, showing a very united right. front uh, to uh, show to the people of Indonesia and the international community also that post-elections there are um, more important things uh, to uh, show, which is to work together to achieve uh, a good uh, target to mm -hmm. provide jobs for right. Indonesians and other economic agendas. Did it make it all the more important when thousands of people took to the streets, especially you had students with seven demands, they wanted an end to militarism in Papua, they wanted um, their questions about government influencing the courts and so on answered. So when, when you look at that as, as politicians on both sides of the aisle, do you feel that you can tackle that better together? It helped. Uh, the students uh, come to the street uh, it's a sh sign a very clear sign that they want uh, change they want different directions and we were running on a completely uh, different platform in the mm. past but joko we focus on infrastructures we focus on job creations and empowerment of smes um, now that the two sides are 
uh, basically merging the platform, now uh, President Joko, we focus on how we could create good jobs, uh, empower the SMEs while continuing to build infrastructures, but a different way uh, of financing the infrastructure build up by inviting more private sectors right. into uh, building the next uh, sets of uh, important infrastructures that would create jobs for Indonesians. You made an announcement on social media to your millions of followers. You said, I'm back <laughs> as Superman. <laughs> Tell me what I had that a lot means. of fun. What does I'm back mean? You don't have a super Superman shirt. No, 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 no. What does I'm back mean? What, what does it mean for you? What are your, your ambitions in the short and long Well, time? I wanted to... Uh, since the elections, I took a six months break. Mm. And a lot of people asked what would be my next um, sort of like political moves. Uh, and I've been saying that uh, I want to focus on spending more time with my family, uh, taking a break, uh, and uh, with that announcement is basically to end a lot of the questions whether I will join party A or party B, but I will uh, firmly be back in my old uh, political mm -hmm. party, which is Grindra. Mm -hmm. And my uh, task, my immediate task is to uh, ensure that the millennials, uh, the young uh, voters, the young generations would uh, understand the decisions by Prabowo to join the government. Right. Uh, and our strong supporters are based to basically work hard uh, in the next three to four years to achieve uh, the development of, of Indonesia. And, uh, you know, making sure that the political cycle of five years not going to push us to be more def uh, divided and, and polarize the whole countries. Mm -hmm. It was a fiercely contested election. It was a divisive election a lot of the time. It was very noisy on social media, yeah. just observing it from the outside. We covered the election closely. You spoke to my colleague, Natalie. Yes, when, when I had a lot was, of fun speaking yeah. with Natalie. So that was back in April, right? And something, something that was interesting was you telling us what you decided, what platform you decided to run on. Let's have a little reminder of, of what you told us in April. We believe uh, there is always, always uh, an attempt to, to get the majority of the, because Muslim is the, the biggest religion, and um, they, uh, each side wants to get the Muslim force as, as much as possible. But I, Prabhu and I have been very clear from day one, seven months ago. If we would like to be competitive, we need to focus on economy. We need to focus on the youth. We need to focus on the moms. So, I mean, this is interesting. Do you look back at that time and think, maybe I should have played identity politics a bit more. Maybe I should have played the Muslim card a bit more because we lost. Well, we have the post-election number. Uh, the post-election number, we did surveys, and we actually were pretty... Uh, happy that uh, actually the Muslim votes uh, was almost 50-50. Uh, the big um, homework for us is actually the non-Muslim votes. Uh, the non-Muslim votes have uh, gravitated 90% plus uh, to not voting for us. So in, in a way, uh, we've done a good job addressing the Muslim votes and it's actually normally distributed. But we haven't, uh, I guess we did not do a good enough of a job to convince the non-Muslim voters that we represent uh, the, uh, uh, basically, Pancasila, which is the core of uh, what our founding fathers uh, believe that Indonesia should be based on, which is mm -hmm. a lot of tolerance. Uh, and we focus on uh, making sure that uh, even though we, we are diverse, but we are unity in diversity. So the framing was pretty much, and looking at the um, seven months back in April, whereby a lot of people associated the, I guess, uh, more uh, strictly interpretations of Islam right. to us. Uh, we did not address that. We focus more on the economy because if had we done this, uh, that probably the non-Muslim voters will, right. will give us uh, much uh, benefit of the doubt. How important is it to do that now, given, for example, the Ahok saga? You were close to it two years I ago. I was there as, as a exactly. contestant also. So 
from the outside looking in, people would say, well, Indonesia is going down a certain path where it's becoming more nationalist, it's becoming Muslim majoritarian, the tolerance towards minorities, non-Muslims, ethnic Chinese is not that great. Are you in a position now where you're saying we need to fight back against that because that is a thing that's happening? Well, that's the reality, but I guess our focus should not be continuing the same narratives. We need to change the narratives. We need to focus on things that cause this polarizations. And one of the most basic ten tenets of uh, the uh, things that divide the people is uh, injustice, uh, is the income inequalities, um, is the uh, lack of access to good jobs, quality jobs. Uh, basically, what happened in Papua, you shower uh, Papua with so much attention, with uh, a lot of infrastructures, and yet the people in Papua felt that they are not part of the, the, gro the growth of the country. So I would say a very strong message from Prabowo and President Jokowi. Uh, now uh, Prabowo is a defense minister, and President Jokowi said that let's settle all, you know, it's past uh, and let's move on. We want to focus on creating a much more, um, I guess, uh, comprehensively uh, positions to cater and, and solve the, the issues about injustice, issues about uh, people being left out, and making sure the uh, voices of the students wanting more and f uh, more, much firmer uh, actions against corruptions is, is heard of because shortly after the elections, the uh, narratives continue uh, and issues about corruptions are propping up, uh, prompting the government to reassure uh, the people that the fight against corruptions is, is continuing mm -hmm. to be uh, as a top agenda of the country. You're a wealthy man. Alhamdulillah. You were well, not as wealthy as seven months ago, but after the elections. <laughs> you... I mean, I, I guess that's the point as well, right? You're a very wealthy man. I don't know, estimates say $400 million plus. I don't know whether you want to confirm that or not. But you have used your wealth while you were attempting to get to the vice presidential position, for example. That's a fact, right? right? Has your wealth made it easy for you to play the game in Indonesia? Or easier than, it, than it's made it for others? We had uh, a lot of problems uh, raising funds from uh, the private sectors, the big businessmen to fund our campaign. Uh, and that's a fact. And it's already fully disclosed to the elections commissions. And to be honest, uh, yes. It makes it easier because Prabhu and I can sell assets and properly, transparently disclose it to uh, the elections commissions and put the proceed of the divestment into the campaign funds. Had it not for our own wealth, it would be very difficult. Now, I think this prompt the needs to change how elections is going to be funded. Uh, in, in the near future, for instance, 2024, because otherwise, if you don't have access to, to capital, you're going to be uh, facing very difficulties because elections is very, very expensive. You have to mm -hmm. uh, campaign across 17,000 islands. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a huge country, uh, 270 million uh, people, populations, and you have to buy TV ads. Right. Uh, so it's, it's expensive and therefore, if we can, uh, use the next two to three years to reform the campaign funding right. law, it will help uh, other candidates. So maybe there's something less impolite for me to say. Okay, you're a wealthy man, but you're also a young man. <laughs> <laughs> and you've mentioned 2024. Are you going to be the candidate for Gerindra in 2024 to run for president? Well, basically, it's too early. Uh, we are here in 2019. The cabinet is there only for two weeks. Uh, it's way too early. But I would continue to help Garindra uh, build the party, make sure that uh, we represent the people, we fight for the people. We would uh, also put up, uh, now that we are part of the government, uh, a very um, strategic positions to put uh, inputs that constructively uh, address what are the issues uh, that face 
Indonesia at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, how to bring in investments in, um, put uh, a policy that create quality jobs, making cost of living stable. Now prices is rising. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, um, you know, uh, the area that we, we believe we have to focus on. And the uh, process will be at the end of 2024. And let's see uh, who would be, uh, I guess, uh, the political landscape uh, take us to be. I don't have um, basically a crystal ball to, to think where I'm going to be. I'm just going to continue to work, hopefully to be close with the people mm -hmm. and contribute to our country. Santiago. Uno, we love following the Indonesian story here on the Newsmaker. So thank, thank you, you very much me. for joining us. Thank you for having me.